Recording has started. Thank you, Prof. You, OK, thank you. It's now 9.29. Let's wait for a minute for the others to come through in. Can you hear my voice uh, clearly, Machilani? Yes, very clear. Right. Student, can you confirm again by reacting with hands? We're just about to start. Yes, I see quite a number of them, Prof. Yes, almost, almost all of them. Yeah. Thank you, student. I'm just quickly going to get a glass of water in case my throat doesn't take all the talking too well, so I'll be back in a few seconds. Yeah, please do that, Prof, and I'll start as soon as you return. Thank you, student, for confirming. Retabile, thank you. You can remove your hand. Professor Mokadong, I see some people are still waiting in the lobby. If you can. No, yeah. Or should we? Give, yeah. Let's give them a few minutes. Okay. Because I've admitted others. Others are still on the admitting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Prof, one of the students wrote that they can hear you very clearly with a very wide voice. Wonderful. <laughs> That's. At least Unisa is doing something right with the... With, uh... Yes, yeah, because, you know, we always have these technical uh, glitches that frustrate all of us, and especially the students. I'm still admitting others, Prof. Let's give them a minute or two. Meeting about 10 now. The admit, yeah, okay. Yeah. Prof is now uh, 9 32. I think we can start. I'll keep on simultaneously admitting others, because I'm afraid that we only have an hour for this session and we want to give the student as much as possible. Yes, thank is you. Fine, Prof? Can I start? Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our last online discussion and thank you for coming. We are aware you, that you are in the beginning of your exam period and probably you want to use this time for your studying and preparation of the exam. We really appreciate that you avail yourself for this session because they are two very important as part of your preparation for your exam. Uh, before I start, let me introduce myself for the benefit of those who might not know me already. My name is Machilani Mokotong. I'm one of the lecturers responsible for the Love Delete. And for today, I will be your uh, program director. As you have seen on the announcement, our discussion for today consists of two sessions. The first session will focus on the remaining element of the Delete while the second session will focus on the feedback for assignment two. We will take a break of 30 minutes at the end of the first session and we will resume. It, we, we have scheduled to resume at 11 o'clock for the second and last session. And our presenter 
is Professor Johan Knobel. I think you know him very well. Before I give him the podium, I'll first like to outline some of the few rules uh, and also to inform you that the meeting is recorded. For those who might be unable to have attended, they can, or even for you, for your preparations, you might have forgotten some of the elements, you'll be able to go to Teams and listen to the recordings. And you will remain muted for the entire presentation. Should you have any agent question during the presentation, please, please feel free to type it on the, or in the chat box. They will be attended to at the end of the session. And we ask you, we beg you, student, please turn off your cameras and or video cameras, because this has a, a negative impact on the sound and the quality of the recordings. Yeah, I think that is all. Prof, you are welcome to can start with the presentation for today, which is the uh, remainder of the uh, element of law of delete. Prof, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Machilani, and welcome to our students. Uh, we appreciate your making time to attend this online discussion class. Uh, I've put an, an old slide on the screen there just to, to put you briefly back into the picture where we left off last time. Uh, you will remember that delict consists of five elements, conduct, wrongfulness, fault, causation, and damage. And in the previous online discussion class, we discussed conduct and wrongfulness. So now we need to proceed to fault. Okay, the other thing that I just want to remind you about is that I said that when one uh, gets to a certain element of delictual liability, or one can say a requirement of delictual liability, then one must always look at that element from two sides, the side of the, um, of the uh, uh, plaintiff and the side of the defendant, and that's actually the slide that goes with that. So the plaintiff has certain things that he would need to to uh, to assert and to prove to establish that specific element. The defendant, on the other hand, would need to, to raise certain defences to try and eliminate that element. All right. And what we also said was that in, in the case of each e uh, element, it's important to, to really know your definitions, your tests, your criteria, your requirements concerning that element. Those you must know very well and you must know how to apply them. You must be able to apply them if we give you a set of facts. And whatever you do, if you can substantiate by referring to case law or academic opinion, please do so. Uh, in the exam, of course, we can't expect a full citation of a, of a case from you. Um, it's quite sufficient to say the Evil's case or the Jones case, especially where one of the parties is perhaps an insurance company or something like that. If you can remember that it's Kruger versus Kutsia, then of course that's that's the, a good way to cite it. Um, it is good if you can tell us what division of the court that case took place in. In other words, if you can tell us that the Supreme Court of Appeal decided so and so in this case, or the Constitutional Court decided this in, say, the Loreiro case or whatever. But that's all that we expect of you. We don't expect the full citation like you would do if you were doing a written uh, res a piece of research. All right, so let's skip ahead and go past um, the things concerning conduct and wrongfulness, and let's get to the um, to the next element, and let's carry on with that. So it's the element of fault, and from the outset, there are two things that you need to bear in mind. The first thing is that one gets two forms of fault. The one is called intention, the other one is called negligence. Um, the question is, are these alternative or cumulative? In other words, must you have both to have liability or just one of the other? 
uh, one of them. And, and obviously the answer there is you only need to establish one of them. Uh, you only need to prove that the defendant had intention or negligence. And if one of those can be established, then liability can follow. Of course, what is important here is the action that you are instituting. So if you are instituting the Octio Legis Aquilii, then you can prove either negligence or intention. But if you are instituting the Octio in Uriarum, then in, in, in principle, you need to prove intention because negligence is not a sufficient form of, of fault for that action. How do you know which action you're going to use? Well, that would, would depend on the kind of harm that you are suffering, but we are skipping ahead. We'll get back to that just now. Now, the other thing is that before you can establish that your defendant had either intention or negligence, you must prove that that person was accountable. And uh, so accountability is not normally treated as one of the elements of liability, but it is a prerequisite for fault, either in the form of intention or negligence. And a person is accountable if he or she, of course, uh, can differentiate between right and wrong and can act in accordance with that insight. And things like um, severe intoxication, like youth, like insanity, things like that can affect accountability. So if you are not accountable, you cannot have fault, and then it means obviously that you will not be able to com to commit the delict, and you won't be uh, you you uh, the, the the potential plaintiff won't be able to hold you delictually liable. Okay, so there you see the everything about accountability that we quickly discussed. It's a prerequisite for fault. You need the definition or test to apply it. In other words, you must decide, is this person capable of distinguishing between right and wrong? And can he or she act in accordance with that insight? And then the factors. You must know what all those factors are, like youth, youthfulness, uh, like mental health, like severe intoxication, etc. And you will find all of them in the textbook. OK, if we then go to the first uh, form of fault, intention, the first thing again is to know the definition because the definition definition in a sense um, really serves as your test of intention. So the definition for in for intention is a, a, a alleged wrongdoer or a defendant act with intention if he or she directs his will against a certain uh, a result knowing that it is wrongful to cause that result. So we can break it up into two elements, namely directing the will and consciousness or knowledge of wrongfulness. All right, if you have both of those, then you have intention. Then there are different forms of intention. Uh, we have dolus eventualis, dolus directus, dolus indirectus. Um, those things are quite interesting and they make very good uh, matter for short questions. But in this exam that, that is coming, you are going to have mainly longer questions. So um, review the various forms of intention and, and be able to, to apply them. But um, th those things are not going to be all that important for this specific exam, whereas if you are doing a multiple choice type exam uh, or a multiple choice type of assessment, those things were always uh, very good material for those. Oh, sorry, I see the animus in Uriandi. Um, animus in Uriandi is the term, it, well, it's just another name for intention, but in a specific context, and that is in the context of the octio in, Uri, in Uria. So, if a personality infringement has been directed at you and you need to prove that that went uh, together with fault in the form of intention, you will say that the person had animus in Uriandi. That's just another way of saying the person had intention to uh, cause a personality infringement towards you. 
Okay. Now, in the law of delict, negligence is really the, the form of fault that takes the lion's share because most of your Aquilian liability cases uh, revolve around negligence. Um, so I would say that most litigation uh, in the delictual kind of cases negligence is the most important form of fault and so it shouldn't come as a surprise if you get um, lots of questions or a few questions counting a lot of marks in the exam about negligence it's a very very important topic it really is a key topic in the law of direct and i can't uh, stress that in, uh, enough all right so first things first you you need to, to know what the test is very simple. It's the test of the reasonable person, also known as the bonus part of familias, also known as the diligence part of familias. Um, also in older cases, known as the reasonable man, but obviously it's not, it's not um, uh, politically correct any longer to talk of the reasonable man. It's too paternalistic. Obviously, we're talking about the reasonable person these days. Anyone can understand that. All right, so the full test is one places the reasonable person in the position of the wrongdoer, exactly in the shoes of the wrongdoer, and you ask two questions, namely, well, basically three questions. The first one is, would the reasonable person in the position of our alleged wrongdoer have foreseen the harm that he caused? First thing. Secondly, would he have taken steps to prevent or to lessen that harm? And then thirdly, did the conduct of our defendant deviate from that of the reasonable person in that position? And if the answer to all of those, so in other words, if the conduct of the defendant deviated from the reasonable person in that scenario, so the, the, the defendant uh, did not foresee the harm and did not take preventative steps, or perhaps foresaw the harm but still didn't take preventative steps, then one can say that the defendant was negligent. Okay, so that's the basic test. There are certain factors explained in your uh, textbook where the um, that one must take into account when one actually uh, applies this test. Um, those factors are not so terribly important, but you can you can mention them for bonus marks. Uh, I can now let me say this later. I'm we, in the second um, session that that will start from 11 to 12. Uh, we will give you some uh, more specific pointers on the exam, and 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 then I will uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, on that. But for the time being, please remember that. Um, the basic test here is the most important thing. You must be able to establish it with uh, reference to authority. And the classic case is Kruger versus Kutsia, Kruger versus Kutsia. Uh, one cannot really answer a question on negligence without mentioning that case. And then, of course, there are some newer ones as well, and they are all in the main text of your textbook. And then the next thing is um, we need to think about the various kinds of defendants that we can have in delict cases because we can for instance have a child wrongdoer we can also have an expert person like a medical doctor uh, who is performing a very specialized operation and now something goes wrong and the uh, patient suffers harm as a result of this and now we want to establish whether this expert person was was negligent. And now the question is, if one is dealing with a potential defendant like that, does the normal test of the reasonable person work? Will it work and can we apply it? So in other words, if our wrongdoer is a child, can we test his or her conduct um, with reference to a reasonable person without specifying a reasonable child perhaps? Because is the reasonable person not perhaps an adult person? That's the first question. The other one is, if we have a, a medical doctor operating, 
would the standard of care of a reasonable person be sufficient or do we need to replace the reasonable person in that situation with a reasonable doctor perhaps or perhaps a reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, uh, brain surgeon if that is the kind of operation that we are looking at those are the questions and there is quite a lot of material around that and those are favorite topics for questions for us so you need to to have a look at those please um, the quick answer is in the case in the case of a child wrongdoer we still use the reasonable person test we don't use a reasonable child test but we take the usefulness of our defendant into account when we look at accountability. And as you remember, accountability is a prerequisite for fault. So even though it may sound a little bit harsh in the beginning that we are testing a child wrongdoer against a reasonable person standard, the youthfulness gets taken into account when we look at, um, at accountability. And there are a number of cases there. The Jones case there is the most important. Um, and, and you need to take, be able to, um, to give account of all of those cases. That's, that's a very important topic for the law of delict. In the case of experts, we do adapt the uh, test. And we will, in the case of a doctor, ask what the reasonable doctor would have done. And in the case of a specialist, we will ask what the reasonable specialist in that field would have done, what that person, what harm that person would have foreseen and prevented, and then compare that with our defendant in the in that scenario. OK, so there's a lot of material to to study, a lot of work to do, and you must be able to uh, be confronted with a long set of facts, giving you all sorts of interesting stories and then you must be able to apply that knowledge of yours to tell us is this um, young child who did caused harm to the neighbor or to somebody else was that young child negligent or not or this doctor operating and and sewing up the patient with a with a uh, with an instrument inside his body or something like that that kind of thing happens sometimes then you must be able to, to use the correct criteria to tell us whether there was negligence or not. Okay, then the last thing, the, the lower, um, the last thing on our slide there, you see the doctrine of sudden emergency. Now that is a specific defense, because remember, as we said, and as we stress always, you need to look at all these elements from two sides, that of the plaintiff, also that of the defendant. So the doctrine of sudden emergency is just a fancy name for a certain defense that a defendant can raise to prove that in a given scenario, um, his conduct did not deviate from that of the reasonable person. In other words, yes, he caused harm. He, yes, he perhaps made an error of judgment, but you know what? He was in a sudden emergency and the reasonable person is just a reasonable person. It's not a superhuman. So the reasonable person would have made the same mistake in that scenario of pressure. That's really what the doctrine of sudden emergency is all about. So two things to do there. The first thing is there are a lot of requirements that need to be met before you can use the doctrine of sudden emergency. So you must know those requirements really well and you must be able to apply them. The second thing is this defense looks quite a lot uh, in certain instances, like a defense that we spoke about last time. You will remember that when we looked at the element of wrongfulness, we had a collective name for all the defenses that can exclude wrongfulness. We called them grounds of justification. And one of those is necessity. Now, in certain instances, necessity and this one, the doctrine of sudden emergency, can look quite a lot like each other and you, it's it can be easy to confuse them but remember necessity excludes wrongfulness the doctrine of sudden emergency excludes negligence so when you study that part go back to necessity and compare the two and make sure that if you are presented with a with a story a set of facts in the exam that you won't be confused and 
use the wrong one in that specific instance. All right, contributory fault. Again, this is something that is of interest for the defendant. So again, this is a defense that the defendant can use to eliminate the, um, the, the element of fault itself. So it follows from that that, oh, let's let's first look at the definition. You see there in the in the beginning definition. So contributory fault, very simple, is fault on the part of the plaintiff. That's what contributory fault is, fault on the part of the plaintiff. Because normally if we speak about fault, it's we are obviously thinking of the defendant, not so. But in this instance, this defense means that there will be fault on the court on the part of the plaintiff himself or herself. OK, so it follows that because we have two types of fault, we have intention and negligence. You can also get two types of contributory fault. You can get contributory intention and contributory negligence. The most important one by far is contributory negligence. So let me speak a little bit about that first. Um, the interesting thing is, in our common law, and as you know, most of our law of delict is based on common law. We have, uh, we do not have a lot of statutes, um, re uh, written laws, acts that really impact a lot on delict. Most of our law of delict is still based on the common law. And in the common law, there was an arrangement for contributory fault, but it worked, it worked differently from what what is pertaining today because today we have the um, apportionment of damages act and those instances of contributory fault that we find most often occurring in in normal cases and litigation in our courts most of those are regulated by the apportionment of damages act so what is the um what what is the effect of a an application of the apportionment of damages act this is quite in, quite important most of the defenses that we have come across up till now all the grounds of justification also automatism that was the uh, defense that excludes uh, conduct um and even the the uh, the the uh, doctrine of sudden emergency that we just mentioned a few uh, minutes ago, all of those are absolute defenses. So what that means is if your defendant, if your defendant can raise this defense and succeed in proving it, your defendant walks free. No delictual liability will ensue. But this, def this defense works differently, specifically the one that is arranged by the Act, because you can get a clue to that in the name. It says the Apportionment of Damages Act. So what happens here is that if you can prove contributory negligence uh, in accordance with the Act, it means that it's only going to be a partial defense. The damages will be apportioned, and that's just another way of saying that the damages will be shared between the plaintiff and the defendant. And what it really means is that the plaintiff is only going to get a part of that what he, of that um, damage that he or she suffered. So one can also say it, it, it gives rise to a reduction of the amount of damages that's going to, to be paid. And this is made by placing a percentage value on the the fault of the uh, plaintiff, the contributory fault, and then the uh, fault on the part of the defendant. So one would say this one would say 40% negligent, that one would say 60% ne negligent, and bearing in them, and, and, and that would be established by looking at the degree to which the court judges the um, the conduct of those two parties to have deviated from the reasonable person in their position. So in other words, you will say, OK, the plaintiff's conduct deviated, say, about 40 percent from that of the reasonable person and the um, the conduct of the uh, 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 defendant deviated, say, 60 percent. 
But there is a lot of work that you need to study very carefully because you will see that there is more than one approach in our case law. Um, the easier and, and perhaps more intuitive approach is that if the one party is 40% negligent, the other one is 60. If the one is 50, the other one is 50, uh, 30, 70, whatever. It always adds up to 100. But the other approach is now you must, you must actually determine the degree of the two uh, parties fault completely independent of each other. So you can, for instance, have a scenario where uh, the plaintiff is, say, 30% negligent, but the um, defendant was, say, 90% negligent. And then you must do some some more intricate arithmetic to get to the to the ratio in according with which the reduction of damages is going to take place. So those are a lot of uh, uh, aspects to to take note of quite a lot of um, things to study and to be able to apply in this very important aspect of contributory fault now next line there you see different permutations and you will remember that i said that the act applies to the most important and the most common scenarios but there are others so what i mean with this is we have two parties, plaintiff and a defendant. We have two types of fault. So that means there are four different uh, permutations, four different scenarios that can present them in practice. So in other words, we can have the most common one. Both the plaintiff and the defendant were negligent. OK, negligence on both sides. We can also have intention on both sides. We can also have, say, intention on the part of the plaintiff and negligence on the part of the defendant, or the other way around, and that's the last, the fourth permutation, and that is negligence on the part of the plaintiff and intention on the part of the defendant. And in all those different cases, we have different outcomes. So negligence, negligence, the first one, that is where the act applies and where we have an apportionment. Um, what happens where the two parties have different forms of fault? The one has intention and the other one is negligence. It's not quite clear, but the the position seemed appears to be the, the most um, the safest answer to give to your client is that the common law still applies to those scenarios, not not the act. And that means that we still have an all or nothing approach, not an approach of apportionment. So what will happen there is, the intention, because it's regarded as a more serious form of fault, will trump the negligence. So say your plaintiff had intention in respect of his own injuries and the defendant was negligent in respect of that, then the, the plaintiff is not going to be able to get any damages from the defendant. On the other hand, say the plaintiff was negligent in respect of his or her own injuries, but the defendant had intention in respect of those injuries, then the plaintiff is going to get his full amount of damages because the intention on the part of the defendant is going to trump the bit of negligence that the plaintiff had. All right. So in other words, all or nothing approach in those two scenarios, common law applies, but it is not, it's not established beyond all doubt. So please have a look at the case law that we have there. It's a little bit on the limited side. It's not completely unambiguous, unfortunately, there's a bit of arguing that you can do there. And then the last scenario where you have intention on both sides, we actually had a case there that decided that because those two forms are similar on the part of the plaintiff and the defendant, we can actually apply the act in that scenario. And in that specific case, it was the, the APSA Bank versus um, uh, Johannesburg Metropolitan Council case. And in that case, the court actually made a 50 50 um, arrangement and the re reduced the uh, plaintiff's amount of damages by a half. Okay, so important, very, very important topic contributory fault. Next element is causation. Um, that simply means that. With let's put it this way, it refers to the link between the conduct and the damage. So did the conduct of the uh, wrongdoer actually caused, uh, cause the damage suffered 
by the plaintiff. That is what causation is all about. But we uh, distinguish between two forms of, co of causation, factual and legal causation. Now, the thing here is these two are cumulative, not alternative. So in other words, in each case, you should in principle have both. Both factual causation and legal causation must be present for liability to follow. So it's a, a different kind of arrangement compared to fault where they are in the alternative and you need to prove one of the other. Here you need to prove both. This does not mean that if you survey the cases dealing with delict in our uh, law reports, that you are going to get discussion about both forms of fault in all instances. Because usually if factual causation is present and the case, the facts of the case are not too intricate and too complex, then normally um, it, it is quite clear that there should be liability. That is, of course, assuming that all the other elements are present, like wrongfulness, fault, etc. Um, but in the more complicated cases, um, it will become necessary to have a look at legal causation as well. And that is specific the case where, where we have a whole series of harmful consequences following from a certain given conduct of the uh, of the defendant. Um, the, the state versus Mokheti case is extremely important there. Let me just see what's in the next slide. OK, let's let's look at factual causation first. Um, so the test is called the conditio sine qua non test. It's also known as the but for test. And this simply means that um, it, it asks the following question, basically. But for the conduct of your defendant, would the harm of the plaintiff have appeared or would, would it have materialized or not? That's basically the question. Conditio sine qua non, that means a, a condition without which something cannot arise. So what, what it entails is you must basically eliminate in your mind the conduct of the wrongdoer. So let's say the wrongdoer fired a shot with a revolver. And let's say um, your uh, plaintiff has a bullet wound. OK, so if you think away, if you eliminate in your mind the firing of the shot, would that bullet wound still have ensued? No, obviously it wouldn't. So that means there is a factual causal link. OK, so that is how one establishes the um, factual causal link. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, 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 certain um, points of criticism that are directed against this um, test. You don't need to know those points of criticism in detail, but if you can mention them in outline, that, that could give you marks. Um, but the important thing is you must be able to apply the conditio sine qua non. You must also be able to apply it in instances of omissio. You will remember we get two kinds of conduct, commissio and omissio. And omissio is where the wrongdoer actually omits to do something. Uh, he sits back and doesn't do anything. So how does one establish whether not doing something caused the harm of the uh, of the plaintiff. So there you need to do something different. You need to insert active conduct into the situation mentally and see whether it makes a difference. So um, you would, uh, so, so the conditio sine qua non is, is applied in a different way there. So say now um, somebody was, uh, let's, let's take one of those municipality cases. So in other words, um, a, a tar road was was crumbling and the, the surface of the road was becoming was becoming uh, dangerous and the municipality did nothing about that. So it's an omission on the part of the municipality. So to find out whether the omission of the municipality, in other words, not repairing the road caused the harm suffered um, by me when my when my car suffered serious damage as a result of that, 
So you would have to insert active conduct. So if the municipality would have taken steps to repair the road, um, would my damage still have ensued? And then obviously it would have would not have done so. So that is how you establish the factual causal link in the case of an omissio. OK, um, then in the Lee case, you will find a bit of an amendment on this conditio sine qua non test. It, it talks of a more flexible approach towards the conditio sine qua non. Um, that's something important that you need to, to, to understand well and be able to apply and be able to mention if you get a question on this. All right, then we proceed to legal causation, which I have now said must also be present. How do you differentiate that from, from factual causation? Um, the best way to do this is to look at the Mokheti case. The Mokheti case was a criminal law case, not a delict case, but it, the principles that have been decided in the Mokheti case have been adopted in, in delict cases, and that is now really the, um, the important approach at the moment. So according to the Mukherjee case, we follow a flexible approach when we um, when we need to establish whether there is legal causation. And the basic question to ask is, was there a sufficiently close connection between the act and the consequence, or the harmful consequence, or the harm, so that that harm can be imputed to the wrongdoer, taking into account policy considerations of reasonableness, justice, and fairness. So this becomes a value-laden question. It's not a simple question on the facts, like the factual, que factual causation question is. This becomes a, a, a question in which policy considerations of reasonableness, fairness, and justice come into play. And this is how it differs from factual causation. So if we can quickly um, think of the facts of the state of versus Mokheti case, that's a very uh, good case to use if you need to explain to us as lecturers what the difference between factual and legal causation is. What happened there was there was a bank robbery. Uh, the bank robber, one of the bank robbers fired a shot during during this robbery and a teller was injured and he was um, he was uh, 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 paralyzed in the lower part of his body as a result of that shot. OK, so he was admitted to hospital. He was treated and eventually discharged in a wheelchair. Now, he had no feeling in the lower part of his body left um, and the uh, medical personnel told him it was critically important that he needed to every now and again shift around in this wheelchair because otherwise he was going to get pressure sores and he would not know that because he had no feeling in the lower part of his body. So the tragic thing happened, he didn't shift around enough in the wheelchair as he was instructed to do. He developed pressure sores, they got septic, uh, the complications were really severe, and in the end, he died. So the eventual question was, could this robber uh, uh, be guilty of killing the the, uh, the teller in this in this instance? Now, if one looks only at causation, we're not looking at any of the other elements now. First, factual causation. Remember, you must eliminate in your mind the act. In other words, think away the firing of the shot. Would the, um, would the teller still have died if the shot was not fired? No, obviously not. So yes, there was definitely a factual causal link between the conduct of the uh, robber and the death of the teller. But now legal causation. Now one must take into account policy considerations of reasonableness, fairness, and justice. And now you need to take into account that other things happened in between, after the firing of the shot, but before the death. And in this instance, the uh, teller omitted to shift around, to change his position, 
um, the pressure sores formed, they got septic, and that led to the death. And what we will say there is that the firing of the shot was in the end legally too remote from the result, the harmful result in this instance, the death. So it would not have been fair, just and reasonable any longer to hold the robber liable for the death. Um, and therefore there was no legal causation in this scenario. So you may personally not agree with the outcome of this case. I know there are many criminal lawyers who do not agree with this case um, on certain policy grounds, etc. But that is not the important part for now. The important part for you now is to understand what the difference between factual and legal causation is and what the difference is between the conditio sine qua non establishing factual causation and the flexible approach establishing legal causation. And as I say, the facts of Mokheti give you a very good platform to do that. The other thing that's important there is you will see that there were all sorts of uh, criteria and approaches to legal causation before the courts decided on the flexible approach. And the, one of the reasons why they call it the flexible approach is re really because all of those other approaches may be used in a given scenario as subsidiary tests. So that makes the main test so flexible. We can actually use those other tests like reasonable foreseeability, direct consequences, etc. Of course, that's a lot of work for you to study and be able to apply. I'm not going to go into detail. It's all in the textbook. One that I'm going to uh, mention specifically is the one mentioned there at the bottom of our slide, the Novus Octus Interveniens, quite literally a new intervening act, a new act that comes in between. So if you think of State versus Mokheti, the omission of the teller to shift around and to prevent the pressure source from, from forming, that was a Novus Octus Interveniens, a new intervening act. And the function of the new intervening act, if you can prove it, is to break the causal chain. So it breaks the causal connection between the original firing of the shot by the robber and the death in the end um, of the teller. So that's what the Novus Octus Interveniens is. And that actually is a principle that was established long before the flexible approach was adopted in the State versus Mokheti case, but it is still extremely important in our law today. So the Novus Octus Interveniens is perhaps the most important one of those old criteria to know really well combined with a flexible approach as discussed in uh, State versus Mokheti. So now you know basically how to approach the two forms of causation. And uh, in the exam, we can ask you a long question combining both factual and legal causation. We can specify that you need to discuss both. But on the other hand, if we give you a long question counting, say, 15 to 20 marks, and we just ask, was there a causal link between this act and this harm? then you must yourself alert us to the fact that you are no, now going to consider factual and legal causation because they are both present. And then you will need to tell us this is how one establishes factual, this is how one establishes legal causation. You will need to apply it to the facts and come to an answer. All right, so now you are equipped to do that once you know all those principles and can apply them. The last element damage. Um, very few questions on damage, if any at all. Um, basically, our approach to the whole element of damage is more or less um, uh, a concept or definition driven. So if you know those few things there, definitions, what patrimonial loss is and non-patrimonial loss and the significance of the difference, what uh, mitigation of loss is, what the once and for all rule is, and what compensating advantages are. If you know those things, you can more or less answer any question that we can throw your way about um, damage. 
Um, it's very important to study your study guide very carefully there because you will see that large parts of the textbook um, are unnecessary for you to study at this stage. So please don't go and do a lot of unnecessary work. Um, uh, once you get to damage and further in your textbook, um, be very, very careful that you always consult your study guide and make sure that you don't do anything unnecessary. All right, then remedies. They are your three main actions, the Octio Legis Aquilei, the Octio and Uriarum, the action for pain and suffering. And um, you will see the next line in the slide there. You must know what the influence is of the form of damage and the form of fault. So basically what happens there is the form of damage that your plaintiff has suffered, that will determine which one of those three actions he is going to institute. Because if you suffer patrimonial loss, you need to institute the Octo Legis Aquilei. If you have um, most forms of, or let's put it that way, nearly all the forms of personality infringement, in other words, your body, your good name, your dignity, your uh, privacy, your identity, all of those things, if they have been infringed, then you are going to use the Octo Niriarum. Then the action for pain and suffering is of very limited application. It only concerns those instances where your body has been infringed um, uh, in a way that that uh, cause you pain and suffering. All right. So in other words, it's a personality infringement because the body is an aspect of personality, but a very specific one. So it's not available for privacy, identity, good name, all of those others, just for specific infringements of the body. But if you suffer severe nervous shock, or these days we call it a psychological lesion, um, because your brain and your nervous system is in a sense part of your body, the action for pain and suffering can be used for that as well. So what is the influence of the form of fault with those three actions? Um, each one has its own fault requirements. So if you now know you need to institute the Octo Legis Aquilei, then you will find that negligence will be a sufficient form of fault. If you can prove intention, you're okay. If you can prove negligence, you're also okay. Case of Octo in Uriarum, um, if you know you need to institute the Octo in Uriarum, then you need to prove intention, or as we call it there, animus and uriandi, but there are certain exceptions and you need to know those. Action for pain and suffering, the form of fault there is negligence. All right, so if you can prove intention, fine, but if you can prove negligence, you're okay as well. Then apart from those three classic actions, uh, delictual actions, we also have the strict liability actions. Now, what we mean by that is, um, strict liability um, refers to instances where we have liability where it's not necessary to prove fault. And um, there are a couple of old Roman law actions that makes provision for, for strict liability in the case of damage inflicted by animals. Uh, the Octio de Popieria, the Octio de Pastu. And if I can give you a tip, um, those are favorite questions of ours um, because they have interesting they have an interesting application because they constitute a, an exception to everything that we have learned up to now. Um, so they are interesting. They've got a nice short list of requirements. So if we need a filler question, we just need a quick five marks out of you here towards the end of the of the question paper, one of those animal actions, those strict liability actions is a nice one to throw in. All right. And then in the last place, you have in, an interdict. That is simply a remedy with which you prevent harm. So it differs from the actions. In the case of the action, your whole delict is complete and the whole purpose of your action is to get compensation for the plaintiff. You want the damage to be compensated. With the interdict, your purpose is to stop the wrongful conduct and actually to prevent the harm or to prevent further harm. So you must know, obviously, how to uh, to to prove that an interdict can be acquired in certain instances.
Okay, joint wrongdoers. Um, I'm not going to say much about that. Just make sure that you know what the difference is between joint wrongdoers and contributory fault. Now, if I can just uh, give you the quick um, uh, uh, basic thing there. Um, The uh, joint wrongdoers are also regulated by the Apportionment of Damages Act, like contributory fault. But in the case of joint wrongdoers, you can never have fewer than three parties in court. Whereas in the case of contributory fault, you can have only two parties because you will remember contributory fault is part on the plaintiff. So you can have a plaintiff and a defendant in a court case and and have a scenario of contributory fault. But where you have joint wrongdoers, you must have at least two defendants because joint wrongdoers are more than one wrongdoer who are responsible for causing the same damage. So you must have at least two and you can have more uh, wrongdoers. That means you must at least have three parties, one plaintiff and at least two wrongdoers. So that's basically the difference there. Uh, the similarity is that uh, you can also have an apportionment in certain instances when you have wrong, uh, joint wrongdoers, but there are also other possibilities and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Act makes provision for them. So please make sure that you, that you know what those are. Then there are specific forms of delict. We get specific forms of dumnum and urea datum. That means sp special instances of patrimonial loss. Again, here um, we don't ask many questions on this part, and most of the questions don't go into nearly the same kind of depth as you will encounter when we ask questions about wrongfulness, fault, and causation. These these ones tend to stay more on the surface. So make very sure in your study guide that you don't do unnecessary work there. Same with the different forms of injuria. Um, that refers to the various forms of personality infringement, and they are or the personality uh, interests are represented by those three Latin words. The corpus, which um, refers to your body and also the freedom of your body, the pharma, which is your good name or reputation, and then the dignitas, which is not only the dignity, it also includes aspects like privacy, identity, etc. Uh, the pharma is really usually the most important one there. Um, and because if your good name has been infringed in a wrongful and intentional manner, you get the delict that is known as defamation. And defamation is actually quite an important part of our law of delict. And so you may get a, a shortish question or two about defamation if, if we uh, get round to it. Obviously, you can get questions from the others as well. But as, as I've said, uh, don't go into the same depth there and, and consult your study guide uh, to, to guide you in that respect. Then lastly, we have liability without fault. That is strict liability. I've already spoken about that. The Roman actions about animals, um, the Octo de Popieri, de Pastu, etc. Those are important for shorter type questions. The other aspect here under liability without fault, which is also important, is vicarious liability. And that basically means that one person is liable for a delict committed by another one. And the classic uh, example of vicarious liability is where you have a, an employer-employee scenario. And the employee in the conduct or in the course of his, of his employment commits a delict. But the employee is not a very wealthy person and it, it would be difficult um, for the employee to fully compensate the plaintiff for the damage that he has caused, then the uh, plaintiff can institute the action against the employer. And even though the employer didn't have any fault, so that's why it's a form of strict liability or liability without fault. If the, rec the, uh, the, the requirements are met, 
you can, the plaintiff can actually hold the employer vicariously liable for the delict of the employee. So there are certain requirements that must be met, and that obviously is very important uh, for you to know, and this is also one of our favorite questions. All right, so that has brought us to the end. I think there's unfortunately not much time left for um, for questions. I'm going to give back to Professor Mokotong just now, but I would perhaps uh, suggest that we keep the most important questions for the next session. Um, that's just the thought. The other thing that I just quickly want to mention is that our next session, uh, you, you received a separate link to join that meeting, please take account of that. And uh, with that, uh, back over to to uh, Professor Mokotong. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, and luckily or unfortunately, we don't have questions uh, relating to the content. And therefore, maybe we should break for 30 minutes and then we'll resume at uh, 11 o'clock for the second sessions. Most of the comments were on how to access the recordings. One student was um, requesting about submission of the assignment, hoping that we can give an, um, an extension. You know, it, they were basically on administrative aspect rather than on the content of the module. And so my suggestion is that we break for 30 minutes and then we resume at 11 o'clock. Student, remember to use a different link for the second session. Thank you, Prof, for the presentation. And then we'll meet at, at uh, 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye for now.